All right, so welcome to Math 150, lecture, I believe, 25. You know, we have our test next Wednesday, uh, I guess in two days. So you can show up at 8 o'clock if you want and have the two hours. If you want to show up even earlier than 8, just let me know. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about applications of calculus. You know, why are we spending, you know, so many courses learning this material? What can you actually do with it? I also want to use this as a transition to the next and final part of the semester for 150, integration. So you know, there's two main themes in calculus, there's taking derivatives, and there's the other direction, taking integrals. This is going to be an application of multidimensional integration. For those of you who are currently taking Calc 2, of all the math classes you will ever take in your career, this is the class that's the greatest lie or misleading possible. You leave the class thinking that you can do integrals, you can't. We have to work extremely hard as professors to come up with integrals that can be done in closed form. Now, amazingly, there are a lot of processes in the real world that can be very well modeled by functions that we can then integrate in closed form. And so even if they don't exactly describe reality, they're often close enough that we can do a great job and we have closed form values, closed form formulas. And we can see if we change a parameter a little bit, what happens. So if I give you a quadratic, you know, 3x squared plus 7x minus 9 equals 0, how would you find the roots? Quadratic. Quadratic formula, exactly. This doesn't seem like when you can use divine inspiration and just factor in your head. We have a formula we can just use. If I change the coefficients just a little bit, then we can see how the roots would change by using the quadratic formula. But in general, we're not going to have anything explicit like that. Before I forget, feel free to grab either munchkins or grapes at any point in time. Um, anything you don't take, I have to put in my backpack and carry home. That's more work for me, so it's better if you just help me out either now or at the end of class. All right, so I always dedicate this to my great uncle who promised me when I was young that I would live long enough to see the Red Sox win the World Series. I have worked with many students over the years on problems related to this. Uh, a lot of them have been paid extremely well and have actually gotten jobs in Major League Baseball. One of them will be returning this Friday and talking at 10 o'clock in my math and sports class about how do you actually make a career of stuff like this? If you don't care about your baseball, that's absolutely fine. You can apply these same ideas to a variety of different fields. You know, it all comes down to trying to find what are the right statistics to look at? What are the right models to do? Okay. And so uh, this is where I could have been today. Uh, the only difference would have been uh, the kids would have been a little bit older. This is from a long, long time ago. Can anybody identify this? Anyway, what gave it away? Yes. So if you look over here, your Fenway Park has a strange, strange outfield. Baseball is different from all other sports, essentially, where you can have wildly different ballparks, and that will affect things. So when we start going into our model, how much do we want to take into account? So the idea is you try to keep the model as simple as possible, as long as possible, and still have something that is giving you results worth obtaining. And then if you can, you start adding in all the different tweaks. You know, fortunately, the rules don't change as you go from ballpark to ballpark, right? No, actually the rules do change. Each ballpark has their own set of rules. So it makes it absolutely wonderful. All right, so just a couple of general thoughts on how you do research, because a lot of this has led to papers with students, presentations, senior theses, build on what you know and what you can learn. So what skill sets do you have? What are your strengths? One of the things coming from Williams that's a huge strength is you will learn not just mathematics or statistics if you come here and major that, but you'll learn a lot of allied subjects. And hopefully you'll gain you know, good conversational skills, good communication skills, which you know, we're gonna hear more about for those of you who come to the Friday lecture. How do you actually convince the people who can say yay or nay to listen to you? you know, it's not enough to be able to do the work. Part of it is what do you find interesting? One of my students began a talk Years ago with you, here are three reasons why we care about this problem. There's one, there's two, and the third is my boss likes it. And that's not a bad reason. One of the nice things about an academic career is at some point you can decide what do you find interesting. You may have difficulty with convincing other people as well. The hardest thing is coming up with good questions. And this is often not appreciated enough that once the right question is asked, it's frequently trained monkey work to solve it. That there's a bunch of standard techniques and anybody who's had the same training will get to them. So uh, I can't remember if I've shown this slide yet in 150, 
There's a lot of different ways of formulating the law of the hammer. I like the last one, which is really uh, succinct. If all you have is a hammer, pretty soon everything looks like a nail. There's a couple of ways of looking at this. The first is if you're really good at something, no matter what you're given, you find a way to convert to your strength. If you listen to a presidential debate, it doesn't matter who the candidate is, after 30 seconds of meandering, they get into the set speech they want to talk about. If there's something you do well, you take anything you're given and you try to find a way to recast that to what you do well. But another way of looking at this, and I've made a very successful career from this, is go to the land of the screwdriver. If they could have solved the problem using their techniques, they would have. They're not stupid people. If they could have solved it with the methods they have, they would have. If you can look at a problem a different way. So when I was dating uh, the person who's now my wife, she was a marketing student. And when they found out, wait, you're dating a math grad student, can we talk to him? And so I ended up starting writing papers in marketing and I've written papers in a variety of different fields because I can recast a lot of what they're doing in terms of a number theory problem or a combinatorial problem. And the people who are working in these subjects didn't really have that viewpoint. And it gave me an advantage over people who had been working in the subject for decades. Okay, so I wanna introduce you to the Pythagorean one loss theorem or the one loss formula. Has anybody heard of this statistic? Okay, excellent. So the goal is to derive the one loss formula. I'll give some ideas of how do you actually do mathematical modeling. We'll see how advanced theory enters into very simple problems. We saw a little bit of this on Friday's class when we did the drowning swimmer, where all of a sudden just you know, trying to figure out what path does the swimmer, does the lifeguard take to the drowning swimmer involve solving a cortex? We will see that there's a lot of opportunities from inefficiency. So a lot of people are afraid, well, I'm just a freshman. I, I'm not, I sometimes I'm not even a freshman. You know, I don't have any useful skills yet. You may not have as many useful skills as other people, but you don't have to solve the problem completely. You just have to do better than is being done. That is a much lower bar. And I've had a lot of students very quickly come up with valuable contributions just from knowing your freshman math, freshman stats. And then if there's time at the end, I'll talk about some avenues for future research. Okay, so the goal is to find good statistics to describe the real world. And so I know the students in 150 have already seen this. Um, I was actually at this bridge recently. It's about 200, I'm sorry, about 620 meters long, or it's also 364.1 smoot, plus or minus an year. So Smoot back in the, I think 1960s was a undergraduate pledging fraternity at MIT. And they wanted to know how many Smoots would it take to get from one end of the bridge to the other. And so they would pick him up, mark, pick him up, mark, and do this all the way to the end of the bridge. The city of Cambridge did not find this amusing. So they had the Smoot marks removed. The fraternity did not find this amusing. So they put it back and it went back and forth, back and forth. And now they have official Smoot markers so that when there's an accident on the bridge, they actually report how many smoots was it from end to end before you, know, you reach the accident. Is the smoot, for those of you who are visiting today, is this a good unit of measurement? Why not? Because not everyone has access. Yeah, not everyone has access to a smoot. And also your smoot may not have a constant height throughout time. And so you would, you know, this is just a terrible unit of measurement to choose. It's funny, but it's not a good unit of measurement. All right. Can anybody see anything special in this picture? Be more specific. Red Sox World Series, I had to sadly give it back. I can talk more about that afterwards. I will talk about it afterwards. I got to establish some street credit, you know, when I'm giving a lecture like this, okay? Yeah, there's got to be a video. It's not just he's a professor at Williams, okay? So there's certain things, you know, you just want to talk about, you know, there are certain things that just, you know, have to remain confidential. You just, you can't really explain all the details of what you do in your life. Some things just have to remain secret and you can't really talk about all the different things that you do, okay? Anyways, so the Pythagorean formula was originally a numerical observation and it involved three pieces of information. This is nice. This is not that much that we have to collect. We need to know on average, how many runs does a team score per game? On average, how many runs does a team allow per game? And then there's some value gamma, it's a parameter and different values will come for different sports. You know, football will have one, basketball another. And if you think about it, the scoring environment is very different in these sports. You know, 
football, basketball, much higher scoring than baseball. And what Bill James numerically observed is that if you wanted to estimate a team's winning percentage, you know, the number of wins divided by the number of games, a really good approximation is one scored to the gamma over one scored to the gamma plus one's allowed to the gamma. And when he was originally coming out with this, this was you know, well before the prevalence of you know, cell phones, home computers and whatnot, we had calculus that you could do by hand. We had calculators. And so he chose gamma to be two because we have a nice squaring function on the calculator and looking at squares does a pretty good job. Does anybody know why they called this or why he called this the Pythagorean one loss formula? So we had one squared squared over one squared squared plus one's allowed squared. Any thoughts as to why? Yes. I mean, it looks like the Pythagorean theorem from geometry. You have a sum of squares down below. It has nothing to do with triangles, but it's a good name. And you for a lot of things you're trying to come up with a good name for something is extremely valuable. It's the name stuck. So originally they took gamma to be about two. We'll see later around 1.8 is a little bit better. Depending on the error, you're gonna get slightly different values of gamma. Um, are people old enough or historically well-versed enough to know about the juice ball error in baseball? When people were doing a lot of steroids and offensive numbers went up, then there's the old dead ball errors going back into the 1930s. There were years when Babe Ruth had more home runs as an individual than any team in baseball save one. Does anybody know which team he did not have more home runs than? No, not the Red Sox. His own, right? There are occasionally people who are traded mid-season and can actually lead both the American League and the National League in some uh, statistical categories. And so you could actually have more shutouts than your entire team if you're traded. So when you have the dead ball error and you have a very low offensive environment, it's gonna be a very different gamma than when you have a lot of scoring happening. And just you know, to you know, put in some numbers and see how well it does, you know, in 2009, the Sox were 95 and 67, scored 872 runs, allowed 736. The Pythagorean theorem predicted 93.4 wins, they had 95. Not bad. Now the Yankees were predicted to have uh, 95 wins, but they actually won 103. So the question is, why does it do a good job in many places? Why does it not do a good job? What does it mean when it's not doing a good job? So a lot of times we attribute uh, strong deviations from the prediction to be the contributions of a really good manager. If you're significantly overperforming your Pythagorean prediction, it's interpreted as your manager is doing a really good job and is getting more out of the team than you would expect. Conversely, what would happen if you're underperforming? Yeah, probably the manager may not be doing a good job. And if you're looking for a scapegoat because the season's not going well, you, here's a good reason to go after the manager. So here are three reasons why we might actually care about something like this. The first is extrapolation. You wanna to try to figure out how is the team doing? So I remember one year, it was a good year. The Yankees started off 21 and 29. You know, they were not doing well, but all the metrics said the Yankees were much better than the numbers indicated. And when you have a small data set, it's very likely that you could have just a couple of bad breaks. And so when you're a team, you're trying to figure out, should we consider the season a lost cause or do we actually still have a chance of making the playoffs? You know, do we want to conserve resources or do we want to go on a shopping spree? And the Yankees decided that they actually were still in competition. They went on a shopping spree, they picked up some plays and they did make the playoffs. So this becomes a really good way to just see how things are going. You know, are you just having some bad luck? Another, as we talked about, is evaluation is you know, the contribution of the manager. This is a particularly nice statistic to look at. This is the era of computers, tremendous amounts of data analysis. Do I have any football fans here? Okay, can you describe the formula for the quarterback rating? This is this monster formula with various things capped off and whatnot. It's normalized, so if you're 100 or above, that's really good. You know, if you're 60 or below, it's really bad. But the actual nuts and bolts, we don't really need to know anymore because we can just have the computers doing this in the background and spitting out the numbers. There is an advantage to having statistics that are so simple you can just look at and see what they are. 
There's also an advantage in having formulas that depend on simple numbers that you can control. There are wonderful formulas in baseball to predict how many runs someone will contribute to your offense based on who else you have, or how many runs a pitcher will allow based on how your defense is. And so you can use this to say, I've got, you know, say $50 million to go shopping this season. Do I want to upgrade my offense or do I want to upgrade my pitching? How much do I expect each to contribute to winning games? Typically about 10 additional runs is usually considered to be another victory. And so you could then look at with simple formulas like this, well, if I can increase my run scored by, you know, 0.2, how much is that going to be worth you know, to me? Just trying to figure out who's worth signing. So that's a wonderful advantage of a simple formula like this, because I can see how it depends on certain key parameters. If I didn't want to hire you know, certain people, if I want to sign certain people, I can see what kind of changes are they going to lead to. All right. So we need a little bit of an introduction to probability. So if you are trying to think of you know, what classes should you take after Math 150, linear algebra is the most natural one to take. But soon after that, especially if you're considering statistics, probability is a great one. And so I want to go through um, a little bit of you know, the basics of probability. For cultural extra credit, does anybody know which TV game show this is from? Price is right, excellent. So the goal is to model observed distribution. So here, for example, is a histogram. And so I'm recording how many times do I score zero runs in a game, one run in a game, two runs, and so on and so on. I just made something up here. And the question is, can we come up with a function that does a good job modeling this? And so the basics we need of probability is the following. We'll say x is a continuous random variable with density p of x if the following three things hold. So the first is the density p is non-negative. The second is it integrates to one. And the third is the probability I take on a value between a and b is just the integral or the area under the curve from a to b. Out of curiosity, has everyone here done some integration? Did your teachers ever mention probability? Okay, so at least, so thank your teacher. So this is one of the biggest reasons we care about finding areas under curves is for a lot of problems, we can relate finding areas under curves to finding probabilities of events. And if we can find probabilities of events, there's a lot we can do with that. Now, in general, it's gonna be potentially very hard to find exact formulas for the areas under the curves. We need to find antiderivatives. Fortunately, there are numerical techniques to approximate things. In general, unfortunately, we can easily get to the situation where for a lot of modern finance, we have to do integrals in hundreds of dimensions. And then we will see later in the class, how do you actually handle something like that? We're no longer gonna get a nice antiderivative. We will find ways to approximate your know, horrible integrals like that. All right. So hopefully you've seen a couple of key concepts in probability. The first is the mean or the average value. I just take every value X and I weigh it by the probability that we take X. The next is the variance or it's square root the standard deviation, it measures how spread out something. So I look at x minus mu squared times p of x dx. So if everything, if my probability distribution is concentrated around the mean very, very tightly, then the variance is going to be small because almost all the mass is going to be very close to mu. So this is going to be very, very small most of the time. If the distribution is more spread out, the variance will be larger. So the variance is a way to just get a sense of how spread out is your distribution. Independence is knowledge of one random variable gives no knowledge of the other. Do you think that whether or not I give a good lecture today is going to impact the Red Sox game that starts at 11? Probably not. It may impact whether or not certain people decide to come to Williams. Yeah, there could be some dependence for that. Uh, how many people have seen Showcase Showdown in Prices, right? Where you have the big wheel and you spin it and you have two tries and you want to get as close to a dollar as possible. Are the two spins independent? Supposed to be. I claim they are not. Why may they not? So you have the wheel, and it's, that's the numbers from zero to 100 in steps of five. And you want to get a sum as close to 100 as possible without going over. If you go over, you lose. And you know how the wheel how the numbers are put on it. So why might the two spins not be independent? Yeah. 
yeah, you might want to try to measure, I might want to try to get it so that it lands on 100 or maybe near 90 on the first spin. Or if I have a high number on the first spin, I might want to go for a lower number. So you, you've got to be very careful. There's a lot of times, there's a lot of dependencies between things that you may not realize. All right. Can anybody identify this character? Has anybody ever seen the Charlie Brown baseball games? All right. So the model should capture the key features of the system and it should be mathematically tractable. What's the problem with these two items? Yes, yes. You know, the more features you capture, the less it matters. So I think in 150, I might've said the experiment when Galileo dropped the two spheres from the Tower of Pisa to show that the mass does not affect how long it takes to land. Who here has heard of that experiment? Okay, what color were the spheres? Right, that's hopefully something that doesn't matter. Now it might actually matter because different colors absorb heat differently. And if you leave them outside for say six hours, then maybe a hot object might fall through the air differently than a cold object. But if they're both coming from, uh, from inside at the same temperature, the color should not matter at all. So again, you've got to be very careful to think which features of the system do I need to keep for my model? Which things can I just throw away? So here's a possible model. I'm going to assume that one scored and one's allowed are independent random variables, and they're drawn from a, some fixed probability distributions. So can anybody give me any concerns about one scored and one's allowed being independent? No, we have, I, there's not enough time to explain why this would be one of the signs of Armageddon, but baseball has declared a tie game just cannot happen. And in fact, there's a beautiful game, the Mother's Day Miracle years ago where the Sox were down five runs to nothing against the Orioles. And in the bottom of the ninth, the Sox scored six runs, the final coming on errors. But as soon as I tell you the Orioles scored five runs in the game, you know something about the Red Sox. You know they did not score five. That is extremely useful information. It leads to some interesting complications in doing the statistical analysis. This is actually what got me noticed by one of the major league baseball teams is that I actually handled, if you know some statistics, these R by C contingency tables where certain outcomes are not accessible. If you go to a hospital for surgery, what do you think should happen? You get the surgery and what should happen after the surgery? You get better. Worst case, if you don't get better, what happens? You, you stay the same, right? Hopefully, hopefully, you're not going to end up worse than you started. Occasionally, there are stories where they remove the wrong organ or they do the wrong procedure. On the, this is why they check things so many times. Because once they do something, oh, that was the wrong leg to remove. You know, it's kind of hard to go, well, we can remove the other one if you want. That's why they are very careful to make sure because a lot of these mistakes you cannot fix easily. But when you're trying to do the analysis, there are certain outcomes that are hopefully not attainable. Hopefully you're not gonna be worse after the surgery than before. Sometimes, however, you might be where it's, it's a calculated risk. If the surgery goes wrong, it's gonna be really bad, but this is the only chance you have. So we know that in baseball, one scored and one's allowed can't be completely independent because they can't be the same. Why else might they not be independent? Okay, so what kind of decisions might you make if you're losing by a lot? So one is you might try to come back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in fact, sometimes you want to protect your pitchers. And this is when like a second baseman or an outfielder will come in and pitch. And sadly, in a lot of these games, they actually do better than the team has been done, doing for the rest of the game. It's like, geez, if we had just gone to the outfield earlier in the game, you know, we might've had a chance. I remember once the Red Sox were playing and they brought in Remlinger. It was the ninth inning. I think we were up 10 to three. When a pitcher comes in, they normally say the ERA, earned run average. It's how many runs you allow per nine innings. Unfortunately, they just had three dashes. And the reason is while he had pitched for the Sox for a while and he had allowed runs, he had not yet gotten anybody out. So his ERA was technically plus infinity and the website that they were using uh, did not have the symbol for plus infinity. 
he proceeded to give up a grand slam that game, but he was able to get the three outs and he actually was able to get a save for his efforts. So can anybody define what a save is in baseball? No, you have, you have some right elements, but not quite. You're up by three runs or less and you finish the game or you pitch the final three innings, no matter what the lead is. And again, the Baltimore Orioles are a wonderful team when you need some strange examples. There was a time when they were playing the Texas Rangers and after six innings, the Rangers were leading 14 to three. That's an 11 run lead. There's nine outs remaining to end the game. They could alternate out home run, or actually home run out, home run out, and the Rangers would still win. So the Rangers brought in a reliever who pitched the final three innings and held the Orioles to no runs. Meanwhile, the Rangers put up another 16 runs in the two innings that they batted. For a final score of 30 to three, came in with an 11 run lead, had 16 runs of support, and ends up with the save. Now, what you hope is that most of the time the save statistic measures what you want it to, but occasionally it will give you bad answers. You have to be very careful about what statistic do you decide to study. <sighs> Certain people know how to take advantage of other people. And if you know people are overvaluating certain statistics, what you can do, and certain general managers have done this, is they can make certain people look like save machines. Oh, you want my star closer with all those wonderful saves. Oh, I can't bear to part with him. I can't, I can't. But I do need a second baseman. Okay, now after a while, there's a limit to how many times Billy Bean could do this and your people eventually start to catch on. But he would make certain people look like save machines and they'd become in high demand. And if you look at it, your three run lead, that's a pretty big lead. And so when you're trying to figure out what's going on, be very careful about what statistic are you studying. Does it really correlate with what you want to do? So in the next class today, I'll be talking more about uh, you know, what statistics to look at. So if you have a huge lead, you might put in different pitchers or different batters if you're losing. You might also, if you're winning, you know, this could be a chance for you to rest some of your starters if you're doing really well, give some other people a chance. So there's definitely going to be some dependencies. The hope is that these essentially balance out and that they're not too bad. Um, I did a senior thesis with somebody here years ago where we changed the problem to more like election night where, where you know, 3% of the returns and we're now gonna call this state for so-and-so. And we started to do that for baseball games. You know, if you had a certain lead at a certain inning, we would say the game is over. We're declaring who wins because you know, at this point you have 99% chance of winning. And we'll just say anything from this point onward is garbage because the lead was so big. Now, occasionally that will give you the wrong answer. There was a playoff game last year where a team came back late in the game down by a tremendous amount where all the metrics said you have a 99% chance of losing. They, they came back and won. But most of the time, you'll be right. And you've got to be careful. Do you really want to reward a team for putting up garbage runs or allowing garbage runs in a lopsided game? It turns out it didn't really affect the predictive power that much. And it's always nice when you see that the simple model does a pretty good job. Well, there are two ways we could do this. We could do a discrete model and we could do a continuous model. So for the discrete model, I can look at the probability I score exactly I runs, I allow exactly J runs, and I sum over all pairs where J is less than I, or I could do the continuous version. Which do you think is better for baseball, the continuous or the discrete? Discrete, right? As much as I would love to see for a variety of reasons, the Red Sox beat the Yankees by a score of pi to E, we're never gonna see that headline. Why might we choose the continuous over the discrete? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's easy to work with. This is our third calculus class, right? We've spent a lot of time learning how to find integrals. Finding sums is a lot harder. And so we're gonna to try to calculate the integral and see if we can make that work. So there's a couple of issues. The first is what should we use for the densities? Are the runs scored and allowed? Is it reasonable to assume that they're independent? And the last is can we actually compute the integrals in closed form? So we can do this for a large class of densities. I actually came to these densities when uh, one of my students at Brown years ago asked me, why does this formula work? And so I am the first person to come up with a theoretical model. The densities I chose were related to things I had seen in my physics classes. 
And you, this is the advantage of a wide education, is the more things you see, the more things you have on your radar, hey, let me try this. And I was trying to think of which functions could I integrate when we see the double integral in a, in a moment. And I found you know, two ones that I could integrate. And I said, wait a minute, these are part of a larger family of functions that I know from physics. Okay, so here is a possible function for one scored. The uniform distribution, everything is as likely as everything else. Do you think this is a good model for base? No. Can somebody give me another possible function? Yes. Normal distribution, anything else? Normal is two slides down. I'm sorry? Okay, give me an example like that. Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The normal was second. I, th I, th I thought normal was third. I am sorry. Um, so you, you, I, I flipped the order of the two. Okay, so here's a normal distribution, mean four standard deviation two. Why might this not be a good model for baseball? Okay, can, can someone give me some issues with this? Well, but we're, we're allowing continuous. Yes. Yes, no matter how bad you are, you're not going to score a negative number of runs. It also allows you to score a billion runs with a finite probability that's greater than zero. Now, the probability is so small, you know, I would win the lottery every day for a year, I think, before that would happen. And so, even though it does allow for the absurdity, of scoring a billion runs, the probability it assigns to that is so small, it's worth keeping down. But the negative runs is an issue. So then we can do what you were talking about, this one-sided distribution. Uh, the simplest one I could think of is an exponential. And again, the advantage of this now is I don't have any negative. Um, it does allow me to score a billion runs, but the probability of that is extremely small. The question becomes, what just matches the data? So it turns out if I use what's called the three parameter Weibull, I can do a really good job of matching the data. So the Weibull has three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma. And if you look at them, all beta does is it just translates where my zero point is, where I'm starting things. So basketball, you know, no one in the professional NBA is gonna score less than 40 points in a game. So I'm not gonna have my distribution starting about assigning zero points in a game. I'll be moving things over. All alpha does is it rescales. It, it, it affects how wide it is, how tight it is. What really matters is gamma. Gamma is the shape parameter. And different choices of gamma will lead to very different functional forms. So here is a plot of you know, several different choices of gamma. You know, the red is the exponential. So the exponential actually sits in this family. The uh, purple, I guess it's, okay, the colors of the, I guess it's the blue. Um, is looks a lot like a normal distribution. These are essentially one bump distributions. You go up, you go down. And it turns out a lot of things are well modeled by that. There are a lot of applications to this in terms of you know, modeling, say popularity of a movie or a song or various things. You know, if gamma is less than one, things die out very quickly. If things are greater than one, it's something that you know, takes a while you know, before it goes out. Um, anybody ever see the Blair Witch Project? or something about Mary. Most movies start with a high demand and as time goes on, the demand goes down. Why? Yeah, that's probably, people have already seen it. People have already watched it. There's a couple of movies that are sleeper hits that start off you know, really small and then word like, hey, you gotta see this movie, this movie's great. And so again, this is a flexible enough distribution that it can model lots of things. What I really want you to get out of today's lecture is not just applying math to baseball, but applying math to lots of different things. So I've worked with professors of marketing to model how should movie theaters choose which movies they show, what times do they show them? And to do this, you need to try to estimate what are the demands going to be for movies? Or if you're the airlines, you need to try to estimate what are the demands going to be for people to go from one city to another? It's the same kind of mathematics to solve all of this. And you're beginning to learn enough, um, even just after your freshman year, to start understanding these problems. All right, so we're gonna need a generalization of the 
factorial function. So n factorial is n times n minus one times n minus two. The gamma function defined as follows, turns out that gamma of n is n minus one factorial. It's a little bit unfortunate that it's shifted off by one, but you can prove this by integrating by parts. It's a nice calculus exercise. And whenever you put in an integer input, you're getting back essentially the factorial function. It turns out I can write down the mean and the variance of the y bull very easily in terms of this gamma function. So all of the slides are online. For those of you who are visiting, if you email me, I can send you a link to the slides in the papers. You can just go through and do the calc one interval and say, I want to find the mean of this distribution. You can play some standard integration games. It's not that bad. And at the end of the day, ah, I've got my formula for the mean in terms of the values of these parameters and this new gamma function, which is an extremely well-known function. All right, so here is a semi-random day. Uh, I can't remember if this is MLB or ESPN, and I'm just broadcasting the standings. Web space is extremely valuable. You know, the more statistics we put here, the less pop-up ads we can have, right? That's a calamity. So we have to be very careful as to what do we put in. Well, we got to put in the team name. We got to put in their record. Do we need to put in their winning percentage if we give you their wins and losses? No, but do you trust Americans with division? Uh, do people know about the Wendy third pounder? So what was wrong with the third pounder? Um, people would say that it was smaller than a third pounder. Yes. Why would I spend less? Why would I spend the same amount for a third pounder when I could go to Burger King or McDonald's and get a quarter pounder for the same price? Yes, this, you, you can look this up. So we'll give the percentage. You know, how far games back? Well, again, we don't really need that. We can do subtraction. No, we can't. We'll give games back. And so if you look at all the different things, they tell you how the team is doing it. It's a league play, their home record, their road record, their current streak, the last 10. And then the XWL is the expected one off. It's the Pythagorean numbers. This is such a valuable statistic that this is one of the few statistics that makes it on the expanded standings that they display. Okay, so what I was able to show is that if you assume runs scored and runs allowed are independent random variables drawn from a Weibull, then you get essentially the Pythagorean prediction. The winning percentage is basically runs scored minus beta to the gamma over runs scored minus beta to the gamma plus runs allowed minus beta to the gamma. And so I'm, I'm gonna go into the details at a very high quick level. You can look at the paper to go a little bit more slowly. The key thing is to take beta to be negative one half, to just put the center off by a little bit. So there's been a couple of people who've been concerned over the fact that we're doing, you know, continuous variables for a discrete game. Well, if I do my bins from zero to one, one to two, two to three, if I score three runs, I'm right at the boundary of two bins. So make the bins go from negative a half to one half. Now zero is right in the middle. Then the next bin goes from one half to one and a half. One is right in the middle. So it's very natural to take beta to be negative one half, just so that our scores are right in the middle of the bins. Well, if I give you uh, my average run scored and average runs allowed, I can actually figure out what they are in terms of my parameters. I can go back and forth. This is just using the formulas for the mean that I showed you before. So if I numerically observe how many runs a team scores on average, and I know what gamma is, I can tell you what the corresponding alpha is. All right. So we want to calculate now is the probability that I score more runs than I allow. So the probability that x is greater than y, so I have a double integral. So we haven't done too many double integrals, I think, in this class yet. Double integrals are often just integrals from calc one followed by another integral from calc one. The hardest part is the region of integration. Well, this is actually pretty nice. X goes from beta to infinity. We're going to assume beta is the smallest we can get. And I want to win, so y goes from beta to x. You might say, well, shouldn't it go to just a little bit less than x? But again, when you have continuous random variables, the probability that you score exactly x runs and allow exactly x runs is zero, so we don't have to worry about that. If you really want, you could integrate up to x minus epsilon and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. No one wants to do that, so we'll just integrate all the way up to x. So we just have a double integral to do. So we just plug everything in. We do some you know, transformations, we shift things. So now we integrate from zero and just we replace all our variables with themselves plus beta. And to maximize confusion, we let y equal y plus beta or something like that, so that we use the same variable name again. And so now when we have this integral to do, you know, this integral is a little bit hard, but oh, wow. Okay, now I understand why Miller's doing this. 
I have basically e to the negative y to the gamma, and I have a y to the gamma minus one. This is ideally set up for u substitution. If u is this quantity to the gamma, this is essentially du. And so I can essentially change this to an exponential. I can integrate it. I can get closed form. That's why I'm using the variable. This is where the miracle happens, is I've deliberately chosen this so that this integral can be done nicely. And so now I, I get essentially just one minus this. Okay, the one is coming from this. And now when one hits this, this is a probability distribution. So when I integrate it against one, I just get one. And now I have to do this double integral, uh, I'm sorry, this combination of two exponentials. Well, I have e to the negative x to the gamma, e to the negative x to the gamma, but I have different denominators. Well, I can combine them by letting one over alpha to the gamma be one over alpha rs to the gamma plus one over alpha ra to the gamma. And now it's just e to the negative x over alpha to the gamma. It's like a new Weibel with a new parameter alpha. Who here has seen something like this before? Some of you should have seen this. There's two possibilities you might have seen it. Okay. Okay. Yes, so stuff like this is coming for the center of mass for some problems in physics. Excellent. There's one other place where this occurs that you might have seen. Also physics, because that's my go-to subject. Circuits? Yes, yeah, series in parallel. When you're connecting resistors in parallel, this is what you get. So this is a really general technique, is that I can often take something that's painful, and by changing my, the names of my quantities a little bit, I can reduce this to something I already know. And so I just need to continue doing the calculation. And this is now just straightforward integration in algebra. And when the dust settles, you get the following expression. And then just when you substitute in, you now get our Pythagorean formula. And so again, it just follows from very straightforward, you know, calc one, calc two. The question is whether or not this does a really good job of modeling the runs scored and runs allowed. If it doesn't, then this is all garbage. So we need to look at a histogram of runs scored and runs allowed. So let's choose a season entirely at random. Let's choose the 2004 season, okay? So here is the predicted run scored. I'm sorry, here's the observed run scored and runs allowed for the Red Sox. And here's the best fit rivals. And we talked about using the method of these squares to find the best fit lines. You can do that to find the best fit rivals as well. I did that. Do you think this does a good job or a bad job in terms of fitting the data? Or do you think we should take a stats class and have something a little bit better than a visual test. Should really take a start class. But does everyone agree that it's not horrible? All right. So going into detail, you're using you know, the method of these squares. What I can do is I can look at how many times I observe K runs. I can look at my predicted number of games that would have K runs and I square it and I add that all up and then I choose the values of the variables that minimize that sum. And that's how I find the best fit rivals. Okay, so here's the Red Sox again. Uh, here's the New York Yankees. Good job or bad job? I think pretty good. What about the Baltimore Orioles? Hmm. Yeah, I, overall, I think the runs allowed seems to be doing a little bit better job than the runs scored. Now, the ones allowed you averaging over more teams than just yourself. What about the Tampa Bay Devil Rays? This is so old that they were the Devil Rays back then. Yeah, they may not have had a good season, but boy, did they know how to decay. Right? I mean, if you look at what they're doing in the tail, they're doing a great job. What about the Toronto Blue Jays? Okay, so the data is bad, but you have to remember, where did the Toronto Blue Jays play? which is the metric system. No, it has absolutely nothing to do with this. It's actually good that the Toronto Blue Jay data is bad. If the data is too good, you might be a little bit concerned that I'm fudging it. Real world data should have some noise. I would be surprised if every test is coming back significant and good. And so let's do a little bit of advanced theory. So I'm going to assume, because everybody's either at Williams or admitted to Williams, that you know if you flip a fair coin a million times, you expect to get about 500,000 heads. Would you be surprised if you got 501,216 heads? Does that seem reasonable? How about 512,207 heads? 
538,012 heads. 578,214. Okay. 612,160. 800,000. By 800,000, do I at least have everybody saying that this is... So the question is, at what point do you get suspicious? About 95% of the time, you'll be within 1,000. So already the first number I gave you was already suspicious. We don't often have a good sense of what suspicious is. Another lecture I can give is on how to use mathematics to detect fraud or to commit fraud, depending on who's hiring you. And so I could talk about you know, actually going to the headquarters of the IRS in Boston and talk about how you can use mathematics to detect fraud. So over here, 95% of the time, what does this mean? Well, imagine we do N independent tosses of a million coins. Then 95% of the time we'll be in a thousand. But what if we keep doing this? What's the probability that if we do this N times that every single time we're within this band? If I do it you know, five times, it's I think, um, okay, this, I'm sorry, this is the probability that at least one of the time it's outside the band. If I do it five times, we have a 22% chance that at least once I'm outside the band. If we do it 14 times, we have a 51% chance that at least one is out of the band. If we do it 50 times, we have over 90% chance that at least once we were outside the band. So when we're trying to do comparisons like we did with baseball statistics, you know, if we had every single team coming in with a significant fit, I'd be a little suspicious because we have so many independent tests, I'd expect at least a 50% chance. So I don't wanna go into too much of the advanced stats theory. You know, this is part of a pitch right now for those of you who are trying to decide what classes to take to consider taking a stats class. There's something called a chi-squared test of you know, goodness of fit. And so it turns out for what we were doing for the runs scored and runs allowed, about 95% of the time, we should get a value of 31.4. At the 95% level, at the 99% level, about 37.57. But this is what's called the bond Peroni adjustment, which is if you're doing many, many similar tests, you can actually inflate those numbers a little bit because you would expect a few of them to come out. And you inflate the number to 41.14. If you look at the Blue Jays, 41.18, okay. That's essentially now just barely making it at the 95% level. Uh, does anybody know when you do the 95% and when you do the 99%? When your data is significant at the 99%, you do the 99%. When it's not, you do the 95%. This is why a lot of people, there's a lot of really good papers about this say, you should not be doing 95, 99% thresholds. You should just say, here's the p-value and let the reader determine whether or not they think it's significant or not. Because a lot of people, sadly, will change what they're doing based on how good the data comes out at the end. So I talked a little bit about the structural zeros, about how we have to be careful when we're doing the tests that you know, we can't have any scores being the same. And so when we're doing the comparisons, there is some complications for stuff like this. But to just briefly summarize, you know, if we look at the data from 2004 and we looked at you know, how many games we're off by, on average, we're off by about four games. We're getting gammas around 1.74, 1.76 which is pretty close to the numerically observed best value of 1.82. And we got this from a nice, very simple theory. You know, we assumed runs scored and runs allowed were independent random variables drawn from y -bulls. We were led to a nice close form probability uh, prediction. And we can now get a sense of the value of how much are additional runs worth or allowed. All right. Um, you can do this for other sports, you know, basketball right now, the playoffs have started, game was around, uh, somewhere between, I think, 14 and 16.5. You can also try to do micro analysis and take into account, well, not every run is equivalent. If you have a three run lead going into the bottom of the ninth inning, you know, doesn't really matter to some extent if I score one or two runs, I need to score at least three. Those first two runs don't matter. And the defense might play very differently because they don't care about that. The hope is that a lot of this work is not really needed. All of the work my students have done on this has always come back, yes, it wasn't really needed. It doesn't do that much better than the main thing. All right, the last thing, we've got about one minute left. I know the people who have taken 150 have already seen the punchline here. So the big advice is to seize opportunities, get to know people. You never know where they will lead to. You can't make this stuff up. So this is Smoot and what he did with his life. 
He became the chairman of the American National Standards Institute and the president of the International Organization for Standardization. You could easily have seen him says, damn it, I'm not going to be a unit of, you know, stop picking me up. And you know, he could have fought it. He could have protested or whatnot. He just rolled with the punches. And I'm just imagining his job interview. Well, I, I don't mean to brag about my qualifications, but I am a unit of measurement. And so, you know, again, there are a tremendous number of smart people in the world. There's a tremendous number of talented people with great skill sets. What's going to distinguish you? We have the oldest alumni society, you know, in the country here at Williams. You know, part of this in the world, American Center. So what you want to do is you want to seize the opportunities. You know, there's a reason why you're not doing everything by YouTube. All right, have a good day all. Uh, if anybody has any questions, happy to chat for a little bit.